This is Isaac Morehouse. Welcome to the podcast where we discuss education, entrepreneurship, big ideas, how to put them into practice in the real world, and above all, how to live free. What if you never allowed yourself to criticize anything? Today, I have my good friend. I'm, I'm super excited to have him join me on the conversation. Good friend and colleague, TK Coleman. Uh, TK, welcome to the show. Hey, Isaac. I'm glad to be here, man. So um, not that long ago, I think I actually think I left you a message uh, on Voxer, our favorite app uh, that we use uh, at Praxis all the time. I don't, I'm not getting paid by them to say that. I wish I was. Voxer, if you'd like to uh, sponsor the show, I'll accept. Um, I left you a message, <laughs> TK, where I said something to the effect of, I don't necessarily believe this is true, but I'm going to adopt as true the belief that there is no value to art criticism, that there's no value created by someone who goes and watches a movie or looks at a painting or reads a novel and then writes a critique of it or a criticism of it. And the reason I wanted to experiment with adopting that belief and say, okay, what if this was true? Can I poke any holes in it? Can I find the real value of criticism? Um, and, uh, you know, apart from like, um, I don't know, maybe we can distinguish later between maybe analysis and, and critique, but it was really enlightening to sort of go through that experience. And I, and I think there is some potential value there, but most of the time, much of the time, what is considered criticism, whether it's of a work of art or even more broadly, is a very little value, I believe, and not just because it's it's not a value for, let's say, the creator of that um, you know work of art or, or whatever it might be, or society at large, but because the critic themselves almost cuts themselves off from some of uh, some other potentially more valuable creative things that they might do. And in the case of art, my my main point was, look, art versus like analysis, you know, a novel instead of a, a commentary on a particular issue, for example, the reason it's written is because it's trying to convey something that can't be conveyed merely in commentary. And so to take it and to try to pick apart the points that maybe it's making or the arguments is to miss the whole point of making it a work of art rather than a work of just you know commentary. It's supposed to be an experience that makes you feel a certain way that transforms who you are rather than a set of logical arguments. And so to offer critique of it is to kind of miss the whole experience. But TK, I want to talk today about criticism about comments uh, and call out culture. Um, so I, that was a big setup with no question. That's probably like the worst way to start a, a podcast <laughs> discussion, but I'm just gonna open it up to you to throw in some thoughts. Yeah, man, I mean, you know, there are a lot of different angles we can take on this conversation. It's interesting what you just said about criticism because a couple of days ago I was reading a Paris Review interview. And for those of you who are literature junkies or you just love hearing about writers talk about their philosophy of writing, Paris Review has given free access to all of their interviews, like dating back to the 1950s. You can even find Ernest, Ernest Hemingway, all of that stuff online. And, and I've been reading a few of those lately, and I was reading one, and it was an award-winning fiction writer, and they were asking him why he doesn't spend time reading what his critics have to say. And he said it's because he enjoys reading T.S. Eliot. I recently shared that on Facebook. I, I just thought that was pretty freaking awesome. You know, um, certainly every person has to decide for themselves how much time they're going to devote to giving attention to what critics have to say versus other things they can be doing with their time, like creating. But, you know, in, 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 uh, in relation to what you were talking about earlier, there was an article I read maybe about three years ago, so I don't remember the blog or the author's name, but he talked about what he called, why wasn't I consulted culture? And he says, why wasn't I consulted is the question that defines our generation. We're so accustomed to having an outlet for publicly expressing our opinion about content, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, uh, but but th that we're, we're offended when people dare to make something without consulting us, you know? So if you create a podcast or a blog and maybe you turn your comments off on the blog. I actually had someone, you know, let me know that they're aware that I turned the comments off on my blog. I recently did this just because <laughs> <laughs> I recently, you know, I, I, I only get good comments for the most part. Every once in a while I get a person to challenge me 
But and that's totally you're not, fine. You're not but... pushing it enough, then. <laughs> Do you want me to come on there and give you some bad comments? Yeah, man, you got to join me. Well, it's too late now because I turned the comments off, but I had somebody message me and let me know that they kind of like my comments and they kind of want my comments back so they can, you know, tell me if they like a post or not. And <laughs> I, I know for you, with you creating your podcast, you know, like you've had people say, hey, well, uh, can you get more people like this or more people like that? And, and so we live in it. We live at a time where th th there is kind of this attitude that does exist that that can be expressed in the words why wasn't i consulted how dare you create something without consulting my feelings convictions sensitivities and so forth and that that can make it that can make for a very difficult challenge for creators but we have to find our ways to overcome it well you know and i actually think i'm actually not that concerned about the negative effects that criticism um and excessive you know commentary the negative effects that it has on creators and the, the way that it can have almost a chilling effect or make it harder to put yourself out there because you're afraid you're going to get all this critique, you know, all this, you know, the haters and whatever. I'm not too worried about that. Um, yeah, maybe there's problems with that. Maybe, maybe you know, criticism doesn't create all that much value for the rest of, of society. But the main danger, I think, with being a critic is what it does to the critic themselves. And I think I, I see there's like two primary costs. One is it prevents a deeper level of genuine self-knowledge. And the second one is it makes it easier for you to stay in a bad situation and harder to exit that situation into something better. And, and, and what I mean by that, so in the first case, you know, if you do this experiment with yourself, let's just take art because we were talking about it before. If you say, I'm not going to allow myself to give a critique of any movie um, at all. I'm going to remove that option from the table. And see what it does. And when I say critique, I mean specifically the really intellectually flabby kind that's like, it's not, let me break down what I thought of this movie and how this camera angle was interesting and I didn't think this one worked as well. I mean, maybe you maybe you eliminate that too and just see what happens. But, but particularly the kind that all it actually is, is offering your opinion and saying, I liked this. I didn't like this. I thought this was weak. This was a bad storyline. I didn't enjoy this movie. Where all when all you're doing is just putting out I disliked this and letting that register and signaling to everyone that you didn't like it, I think you cut yourself off from some valuable self-knowledge and insight. And if you don't make that an option, what it forces you to do is okay, I'm not allowed to say I disliked it. If I want to talk about it at all, how can I then? And you have to start examining what is it about it that didn't sit well with me? What would have sat better with me? Was there some underlying theme that I felt wasn't addressed well? Or was there something about it that just seemed untrue? And what would be a truer representation of reality? And you start to learn so much more when you have that kind of pressure release valve of just voicing the words almost in a cathartic way, that movie sucked. It relieves enough pressure that you don't have to explore a little bit deeper why it didn't sit well with you and you cut yourself off from that from that self-knowledge. Oh, absolutely, man. And I think the easiest thing for people to do is something like that is fall back on defending themselves and perhaps their sincerity or their lack of time, you know, saying something like, well, everyone doesn't have time to explain their criticisms, Isaac, or you know, sometimes I only have, you know, a few seconds to tell you if I like it or I dislike it or if I disagree, but I don't have time to argue. And, and I think it's important to point out that in a discussion like this, it, it isn't about what you do and don't have the right to do. It isn't about what's morally permissible or what's unethical for you to do. That's not what it's about. It's about how can I maximize my time, my energy in order to fulfill my potential and get the most out of human experience. And, and I think that's the, the concern that you and I have around this issue, because I agree with you that as a creator, I know how to tune critics out in order to keep focused on what I need to do. And I also know how to learn from them when, when there's a time for that. But I too am most worried about what this does to the critics. So for instance, in the, the Praxis philosophy module, which we just recently finished, one of the things we talked about quite a bit is making the distinction between critical thinking and expressing disagreement. And this, these are two things that are often conflated. It's easy to assume that if I say something like, eh, I'm not really impressed by 
William Lane Craig's are, you know, uh, cosmological argument. You know, I'm, I'm not really impressed by that. It's easy to assume that you sort of put yourself on a higher plane than him because, hey, after all, you're not impressed. But that's not a substitute for doing the work necessary to have an informed opinion. Mm. That's not a substitute for actually sitting down and, and going beyond the, the feeling that there's something wrong with this argument and, and challenging yourself to develop the ability to demonstrate where it's wrong. It's one thing to know that something is true. It's another thing to show that something is true and challenging yourself to go beyond knowing and actually engaging in the, in, in the task of showing can really help develop the mind in interesting ways and give you an appreciation for the creativity and intelligence that's involved in a lot of the things that you disagree with. Uh, there's an article called The Complexity of Contextual Communication where Ravi Zacharias says, Anytime you can take another person's beliefs or ideas and completely mock them and make them look stupid, chances are you don't understand those ideas and you don't understand people. You know, uh, it, I think that is a, a especially uh, dangerous trend in, in philosophy in particular because there's such a value placed in philosophy, rightly so, on skepticism and what's often called critical thinking that not to just accept arguments and it's just really easy to make that slight transition from I want to examine all of these things to I'm just going to say everything is not a sufficient argument. Nothing is good enough. It's all false and therefore I can kind of never be duped um, and I can get let myself let myself off the hook. Yeah, as I as I alluded to before, you know, I said there are sort of two things that I worry about. You know, for myself, for example, if I find myself in the mode of critic, and, and the one being the lack of self knowledge um, when you don't think deeper, and the other one is, in terms of real life action, playing the role of critic can remove the impetus to find solutions. Um, I'm thinking about things like in a workplace, for example, or a school that you're a, a member of, or a church, or some some sort of social group like that where you're really unhappy there. And if you let yourself play the role of critic uh, and the role of martyr is similar as well. I think they're, they're different in different ways, but um, where you kind of sit at the back of the room, arms folded and make like wry sarcastic comments about how dysfunctional things are. It's very easy and it's got some short-term rewards. You'll be, you'll be popular among a small clique. You'll always attract a few people who want to hear what the critic has to say as he sort of mocks the situations that he's a part of. He's, he, he or she is, is at the back of the classroom or the back of the meeting room at a company they work for. And giving yourself that vent and playing the role of constant critic, it removes the pressure and the need and actually make, raises the cost to you of actually exiting that situation because you get these social benefits of you know some people that will gather around you because you sort of protect yourself from well anything the company does that you don't like you can always disavow because you've always been the critic um, you shield yourself from accountability and and you you have less incentive to exit that situation and find something better and that's really dangerous that's something I always am worried about myself falling into um, in in playing the role of the critic I don't know if you've ever experienced anything like that or if you have any ways that you try to combat that and check yourself. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot we can say about that. So there, there's this pretty cool philosophy of bites, uh, po philosophy bites podcast, where they do an episode on the meaning of life. And there's a philosopher, John Cottingham, and he talks about one of the most important elements to constructing a meaningful life is integrity, doing things that make the world a better place, creating value for other people, etc. And, and we all have this need to feel like we're living lives of integrity. And sometimes criticism can be a substitute for doing the hard work of meeting that need. In other words, th there's a sense of righteousness that comes, a sense of superiority that comes. If I can step back, look at the person out there that's trying to make things happen and just pick it apart, point, point out how it's falling short, point out how there's not enough of this or there's too much of that. And I get to send a signal to society that says, hey, I'm the kind of person who cares about these things. You know, I have righteous beliefs and righteous indignation and righteous convictions, but I'm not actually doing anything, right? I'm not improving the situation. I, in fact, I'm not even thinking enough about the way I'm communicating to the person I'm criticizing to, to gauge whether or not I'm having an impact. And challenging yourself to go beyond criticizing and ask yourself, well, 
how, how can I get involved in creating? How can I hold myself accountable to making it better? It doesn't have to take the form of, well, all right, well, instead of criticizing people who make movies, let me go make my own movies. Or instead of criticizing people who make blogs, let me go write my own blog. Because we all don't have time to make our own version of everything. However, if you really care about changing the world and creating value, when you criticize, you'll focus on more than just the feeling of superiority that comes from calling people out in public. And you'll actually try to communicate with people in a way that might get them to listen to you, that might result in them being persuaded to act on your behalf. So one, one example of this might be if I don't think there are enough Black people on your podcast, right? Let, let, let's just say that you have no Black guests and I, I think there ought to be more. What's most likely to be effective? Me getting on Facebook and calling you out publicly like, hey, Isaac Morehouse has no brothers on a podcast. <laughs> or or how, how about if I know that I'm in a position of influence with you, I know that you take my recommendation seriously, I can just make a list of about five guys or five uh, women who are, who are really interesting people who talk about the sorts of things you like to talk about on your podcast. And I can email you and I can just say, hey, Isaac, I think these five people are really interesting. You should check them out. They'd be great guests for your podcast. And if you happen to interview one of them, bam, I've come a step closer to achieving my goal. I've actually changed the world because I've communicated in a way that was goal or oriented. The goal was to actually get something done. It wasn't to just enjoy the feeling that to enjoy the feeling of being better than you. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's also a, I found at least for myself, there's kind of a, a powerful dignity in the art of ignoring things as well. So sometimes you just can't think of a, a creative, productive way to respond to something that maybe you dislike. You're not going to, you're not going to make a movie yourself, even though you don't like the movies that are out there and you don't know of any way to, you know, communicate the reasons that you're unhappy with them or, or come up with some sort of thing that will, will improve the situation by reaching out to a director or something like that. There is something really powerful about just ignoring things that you don't like. And just, you know, I, I have a moving to the, to the related topic of just comments in general. And in the social media world, this is a major part of what makes it tick. I've kind of created a rule for myself and I don't always follow it. Um, that I, that I almost never read comments uh, especially on stuff that I've written or produced. Um, and I rarely engage in commentary on like a Facebook thread, for example, on a piece of content. Um, and the reason I think is a, a couple. One, when you remove that option for yourself, you find even really simple ways to create. Anyone can post a Facebook status update, right? So rather than if I read, if I see an article that's shared, for example, about something that I strongly disagree with or find, you know, off base, rather than just jumping in the comments, and certainly doing something like, you know, just trying to signal to the world, I don't like this, you know, I disagree, dumb argument. Um, think about it and then ask yourself, because there's kind of a higher bar for your own status versus a comment on someone else's. Okay, if I'm not allowed to comment, do I want to create my own status that, and I always try not to directly reference people or even uh, specific articles or arguments, but rather like the broader issues at play that I'm interested in. Is there a status that I would like to post that that shares in some way that represents me and what I believe my thoughts on this situation? And sometimes there is, and I do that. Uh, many times there's not. And by removing myself from it, I have so much more peace and so much more time and I'm able to be more productive because the minute you put a comment on something, this weird thing happens, you become emotionally invested in that thread and you keep coming back and checking on it and looking at the notifications and you get like sucked in and there's something about that that kind of takes away, I think, the a bit of your creative power. Oh, absolutely, man. You know, there's this verse in the Bible that I think is really cool where it says, all things are permissible, but not all things are profitable. And sometimes it's important to think about our choices, not merely in terms of, hey, is it okay for me to do this? But also in terms of, hey, out of all the things I could be doing, is this the best possible thing for me to be doing with my time? And, you know, if, if you want to comment and get into arguments on Facebook, I mean, that's no sin. That's that, There's nothing, I guess, objectively wrong with that. Sure, go ahead. Use your time however you want to use it. But in terms of being the best possible version of yourself, which is a theme that's very important to me, is that the best use of your time? Are, are there things you could be reading, things you could be creating? Um, in, in fact, sometimes you can make the tension you feel 
from looking at something you disagree with work for you. You can take that energy and instead of writing a Facebook comment, which may only have a certain level of impact, you, you can hold that in and channel that along the lines of writing an article or creating a, a podcast episode or, or, you know, doing anything, making art that, that might actually have a broader audience or a deeper impact. And the message might be communicated with greater substance. Hey, but I want to flip the script and ask you a question. <laughs> oh, I had a couple of questions for you, but all right, fine. Go ahead. We'll let it ha We'll let it slide. Just, just <laughs> we'll go ahead through. and take control of the show. <laughs> okay. So we've been talking about call out culture and sort of criticizing the limitations of that. But what about the opposite? There are some people, and we can use Socrates from the history of philosophy as an example of this, where this was a guy who rarely set forth his own ideas or created something independent. And I mean, he, his entire life was about calling people out who pretended to know things they didn't know or who presumed to know things they didn't know. And, and there are some people who not only make successful careers, but who actually have an impact by just calling people on their BS. There are people that call politicians on their BS. You know, they call the Fed Reserve on their BS and they seem to do a lot of good. So do you think there is a place for, for call out culture to that, that maybe criticizing could be a form of creativity in itself? Oh, absolutely. If you define it, depending on how you define it, as we've been talking about it, just uh, making a statement that voices your feelings or thoughts or disagreement on something, I think there's almost no value. Um, I mean, there's very rare cases where just saying, I don't like this, uh, has any value, uh, at least any that exceeds the negative value. But take Socrates, for example. You know, to call Socrates a critic, um, it feels a little bit misleading to me because what what is Socrates famous for? Asking questions. And asking questions of someone one by one, digging deeper and deeper and forcing them to get at the root, you know, the, the unchecked assumptions that are part of their argument or the, you know, the, the problematic places their arguments may lead. Um, that's more like an investigative process. And it's a, it's a kind of expose. It's a kind of critique without just saying, you know, like, I think that this dualistic view of the world is stupid or something like, or something like that, or this just doesn't feel right to me, or this dude's a weak arguer, right? It's so much different to say, okay, what do you mean by that? Tell me why, how would that contrast to this and pushing and, and giving actually an intelligent critique or critical analysis of an idea of an argument, uh, not appealing to the person who made it and saying they're just a bad person, or I just don't like the way this made me feel, or it's just some weak sauce, um, but actually delving in and grappling with things and asking questions, sort of a question-driven critical analysis, um, I think is ridiculously valuable and ought to be engaged in all the time. And I think that's really what criticism is at its best, at its kind of highest form, but we let ourselves slowly substitute. And I think everyone has an inherent, like a great respect and almost fear of that kind of thinking because it's very powerful. And it's, and if someone starts asking you, you know, Socratic style questions, it can make you start to get a little bit nervous because you're like, oh no, they're trying to trap me. Um, we have like a, a kind of a reverence of that and, and it's easy to make a quick switch and and take on the role of skeptic or critic and pretend that's what you're doing when all you're really doing is just saying, this is stupid, that's dumb, oh, I could destroy that argument, um, but not actually doing it. Oh man, you know, I have a cool little story from when I was a little kid, I used to go play uh, basketball with my older brothers all the time, and all of these guys were really, really good basketball players, and, and somehow the basketball gene was significantly diminished when it came to me. Yeah, but, I remember I um, played you one time. My <laughs> kept I don't claiming, remember. You kept claiming home court advantage or something. Yeah, that was it. You had home court advantage. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but so we we're, were out at the park playing basketball, and my brothers had this thing where they would just sort of make fun of guys that couldn't play and that were making <laughs> bad decisions on the court. And so wanting to be cool, wanting to fit in with my bros, I, I started to get in on it. I was like, ha, 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 look at that guy. You know, like, ha, ha, look at him. And my brother Lamar called me on it, and he was like, okay, you do it. And... In that moment, I realized in, in, in a very embarrassing way that sometimes we call out other people on their BS 
because we don't want to call out ourselves on our own BS. The fact of the matter was, as my brother Lamar was pointing out to me, I hadn't earned the right to criticize those guys because I couldn't even do what they did, you know? And, and, I, was, and I was hiding behind other people's expertise. I was hiding behind other people's opinions. And, and it doesn't mean, hey, you need to have the ability to make a film in order to have an opinion on a movie. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is it's so important to make sure that when you feel inclined to call someone else out, you ask yourself, not only is this the best way for me to handle this situation, but have I really earned the right? Am I truly doing this out of a desire to make the world a better place or to give someone the truth so that they can use it to become better? Or am I just trying to look cool to impress the people that I'm with? You know, fear is a good is a good barometer or a good warning sign. If your criticism of something or your attempt to call something out, if it's tinged with any element of fear that what if they respond in a certain way or what if someone calls me out, if there's any, you know, in, in your case on the basketball court, part of what you were doing was to kind of bolster your own feeling of like, I'm identifying with the guys who are good at this and kind of letting their reputation, you know, be your protection. And I'm going to make sure I'm identified as that by calling someone out. And the minute, if you imagine someone turning it back on you, if that makes you scared, then there's probably like a, something there that needs to be that <laughs> that needs to be dealt with. I think I think the best form of of criticism or critical analysis is one that's done in a really open-minded way, where you're not at all threatened by the response. If the response or the result of the discussion is that you were wrong, if that threatens you or is like you know something that's costly to you that you're afraid of being true. Um, then it's probably best to not not go ahead and offer that criticism until you're more comfortable, until you're genuinely offering it in a way that's questioning and, and seeking to find the truth without without fear or threat. All right, I got to ask you a question though. Um, mm -hmm. What is your personal way of dealing with? So you do a lot of of creating. You write a lot of blog posts and articles. Uh, TKColeman.com and blog.discoverpraxis.com as well. Um, places you can find TK and you've done podcasts and different things. So you inevitably get a lot of comments on Facebook and on your blog and, and criticisms. What has been your personal practice? Do you engage in those? I know you said you turn the comments off your blog. I also want to know why you decided to do that. But how do you deal with this personally? So I, I turned the comments off my blog to answer that first. I turned the comments off on my blog because I just wanted to focus on creating. And to be honest, 99% of the comments on my blog were all words of praise. People saying, which by the way is almost less valuable than, you know, when someone's just like, good job, love it, keep it up. Like as a comment to just kind of fill up space, it's almost like, I don't know, Hemingway says something to the effect of reading critics is, is almost never valuable because, um, if you know, your stuff is good, then no matter what someone says about it being bad, you just know it's not true and you don't care. Uh, and, and if they say it's good, you already knew that if you know, your stuff is bad. Uh, the last thing you want to hear is someone piling on and it's even worse if someone says it's good when it wasn't, then you feel like, you know, <laughs> but <laughs> the valuelessness and even positive, uh, forms of, you know, voicing one's opinion. But anyway, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. And you know, I gotta say for, for my first two years of blogging, and by the way, I don't presume that the fact that my comments were mostly positive means in any way that my writing was good. It just so happens that the kind of readers I've attracted have all been relatively respectful people and people who just happen to like what I'm talking about. But I, 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 I gained a lot of energy from my first couple of years of blogging from all the encouragement. But as my audience grew, it became harder and harder for me to reply to every comment. I, I knew that I, I wouldn't be able to keep up with it. And in addition to that, I wanted to make a priority out of writing the kinds of things that would make a person want to comment more than responding to every comment. And I just had to make a choice. Oh, that's, it wasn't that's an interesting. easy choice. That's interesting. So you felt like that incentive altered your writing in a way that you weren't necessarily happy with? Wait, say that again? The incentive to write things that would generate more comments, you felt like that was kind of steering you in a direction that was suboptimal? Well, well, I think the the pressure of feeling like I needed to reply to all of the comments or, uh, or or pay attention to them, like I was letting people down if I wasn't doing that. I think that was more of the distraction. I just wanted to focus on developing my thoughts, being a better communicator, and you know, 
being a, being a creator, being prolific, like putting stuff out there. And there's only so much time available for for talking and 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 reading things that have nothing to do with you know with what you feel you need to be studying in order to become better at what you do. So I, I think everybody has to make choices about what they're going to cut out of their lives if they want to be the best possible version of themselves. And for me, the practice of replying to every comment that people make about my work, that, that's one of those practices that had to go. Now, I still comment sometimes, but you know, I, I don't hold myself to the standard of commenting on everything anymore. I, I just had to let that go. But as far as how I deal how I deal with the experience of being criticized, because I still can't run from criticism. And, and and that wasn't an effort to run from criticism. But you know, my Facebook page still gets comments or when I go give talks, you know, people give me feedback. And for me, I mean, it's just a matter of I take what's useful and I leave everything else behind. And I, I try to look at people's comments through the lens of will acting on what they say help me more effectively create the results that matter most to me. So if someone says, hey, I feel like you should have used this word more than that word. So for example, there was a time when I first started blogging, I wrote something about how life would not be worth living if this, if that. And I was so passionate about it. I, I, I followed it up with, it's better to be dead than to do something like you hate or something like that. And, and there was a guy who wrote me back right away. And he was like, TK, I think you should be careful. And I'm going to tell you this before you get an audience and before you influ you're influencing lots of people. Like, I would just be careful about how I word things. You don't, you don't want to ever imply that, that someone would be better off dead than dealing with a tough situation or what have you. And, and I, I carefully considered his words and I concluded he was absolutely right. And I immediately deleted that post. I rewrote it, changed it. And I felt like I became a better writer, a more sensitive person because of it. But then there, there have been criticisms where like when I first started writing, I would end every blog post with this, the phrase, at least that's the way I see it. And that was just sort of a habit that I naturally had. And and I, one day I just decided I didn't feel like saying that anymore. I just wanted to write what I wrote and it should be obvious that this is the way I see it. And someone wrote the first blog post I did, someone wrote a comment that said, you know, I really liked it better when you preface everything with at least that's the way I see it. <laughs> oh, and uh, they, they were really disappointed in me for daring to set forth my ideas without that qualification. Like, <laughs> hey, th this is just how I see it, everybody. But you know what? Like, I, I, I respected their opinion. I appreciated them being honest with me. But for me, nah, I'm not going to I'm not going to attach that statement to everything I write. And some people may want it to be there and maybe those people are just not my audience. At some point, you have to remind yourself that you can't create interesting, useful or beautiful work if you insist on everyone finding your work to be interesting, beautiful, or useful. You have to be able to say everyone is not a part of my audience. Oh, so man. there is a balance there. That's a huge, a hugely important lesson. Um, the who your audience is, and and that's the thing about about criticism too. Often, if you find yourself saying these arguments are just dumb or this is totally untrue, if it's a if it's a let's say an essay targeted at a particular group, if it says you know whatever, uh, dog owners, you need to clean up after your pets better or something like that. If it's something specific, especially, and you find yourself saying, these are all dumb arguments. It's really instructive to ask, am I the intended audience? Because very, very many times, uh, you're not. And really, you're just a bunch of noise. I mean, it's like if you go to a, a lecture that's given to, you know, 200 high school students and then there's like three 50 year old guys in the room and the lecture is about high school students how to pursue their dreams and the Q&A the first person to raise their hand is a 50 year old guy and everyone's like come on dude you're not the intended audience like leave your questions and criticisms for those who are <laughs> you know and that's something you find I mean I, I've written some just sort of very basic it's, it's hilarious the, the blog posts that get the most criticism and like anger. Like I've written some really radical stuff, you know, like, Hey, what would, what kind of order could emerge if there were no government at all? What if all services were privately provided? But yeah, yeah. You know, get some discussion. No, the ones that get the most controversial, like engagement are things like 
you know, five tips for using email, you know, use a Gmail account. Don't use a uh, AOL or a dot edu account. If you're in the professional sphere and like people get up in arms and go crazy. And I have, I have one particularly about email where all these, all these people on Facebook were like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I, I don't look down on people for using their edu email address. And almost all of them that were really up in arms about it were professors, like people in academia. And it's like, look, this is not you. This is not, you're not the target audience or it's neither are your students. Like when you're entering the professional world, that's all I'm saying. It's just a little piece of, of advice. Like getting those criticisms from people who aren't the intended target audience is particularly something that I think you have to learn to, to kind of overlook. Um, because like you said, there can be critiques or, or feedback that is valuable. Um, but who it's from and, and just really like knowing whether it actually resonates with you or not, I think is, is really, is really important. Oh, absolutely, man. And there, there is this illusion that there's an approach you can take to delivering your message that will be universally embraced. And when, when I was a kid, it's funny because growing up in church, Jesus was used as the example for this. And this is the irony of ironies. People would say things like, you know, communicate your message like Jesus. He was able to speak so that even little children understood him. He, he was he so spoke. inoffensive that he, <laughs> he was killed. <laughs> right. Right. It's like when you actually read his teachings, he was so radical and so offensive that there were people who thought he was preaching cannibalism and he didn't even spend time trying to convince them that they were misunderstanding him. Like He was too busy doing what he was doing. So it's like he was so controversial, like you said, that he had a lot of enemies. But there's no approach you can take for it. You pick anyone out there that you think is a good writer or a good communicator, and I can show you someone that is hated by many people for what they say, how they say it, or for what they're not saying. One of my favorite bloggers is Ash Amberger from the Middle Finger Project, and I had a chance to interview her sometime uh, last year, and I thanked her for the way she communicates. You know, she she communicates in a way that's very straightforward. She'll she'll make all kinds of off-color jokes, and there are people that get offended by what she has to say. But I don't think her writing would be good if she didn't speak in the way she speaks. And I don't think she talks that way in order to be a shock jock. I think that's who she is. You can feel the genuineness in her writing. And more importantly, if you look at the audience of people, and it's a very big audience, of people who are inspired by her, those people love her for the way she communicates. So you have to balance that, that you know, your willingness to learn from critics with the need to be authentic. Mm. because at the end of the day, you can always go out there and make money doing something you don't believe in. But I think any message that you offer, it has to at least begin with what you believe in. And it has to begin with a way of expressing it that matters to you. And if you trade that in just to avoid critics, well, what's the point of creating? What's the point of writing? What's the point of speaking if you're not delivering it in a way that means something to you? Yeah, there's there's something particularly either as the critic or as the, the creator um, particularly useless about the type of criticism that takes the form of you should be somebody different than you are, or why did you not say thing? You know, why, why didn't you include stuff that you didn't mention criticisms of what you did not say? I always find particularly odd. It's like, if you're writing an op-ed, for example, it's, you know, 700 words and you make a very simple argument for one thing. It's not uncommon to get a criticism. that's like, why didn't you also say this? And <laughs> it's like, well, because I didn't, I left it out. It doesn't mean I do or don't agree with that. There's just only room to do so much. Or like, why don't you cover this topic more? It's like, well, that's not the topic I cover. That's not who I am. Why am I, it's so funny. Once you start creating, it's almost like everyone else feels like you are owned, like you're a common good and anything that they want created, you're supposed to churn out for them. You know, it's like, well, how come you don't do more of this? I really like that. Or, Hey, um, you know, you talk about economics, you should sound more like Milton Friedman. I really like the way he talks about things. And it's, it's like, okay, great. Uh, but I'm not him and I have a different, it, it's, I always just find that very odd. There's almost like the sense of entitlement from, and, and again, I fall into it all the time as well as like a consumer. You see this with artists all the time. If they've produced something in a certain way and then maybe they, they release a new album and it goes a different direction stylistically, you have this feeling as a consumer like, no, 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 no they owe it to me to be doing this kind of music. And, you know, it's almost like an affront to you, you know, <laughs> which is very bizarre. I don't think it's a very healthy um, mindset or approach. So I want to, I want to ask you about something slightly 
maybe more specific than what we've been talking about with criticism and commentary. And you mentioned it before, uh, call out culture, but you, you earlier, we had a conversation, um, not on the podcast, just, uh, between the two of us. I think it was on Voxer again, shout out to Voxer waiting for that sponsorship deal. Um, where you, you specifically mentioned <laughs> the problems with what you called call out culture. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by a call out or someone, you know, calling someone out or call out culture? What does that mean? Calling someone out is the practice of pointing out what you perceive to be people's shortcomings, either in their philosophy or in their practice, usually in a public form, whether that's I'm an audience member of a talk you're giving or on Facebook page, I'm going to call you out. But it, it, it's really about saying, hey, you, you're doing something wrong or there's something right that you ought to be doing and you're failing to do that. And, you know, so, and sometimes it can be a good thing to call people well, out. And, and it's often, sometimes it can be an unproductive thing. Well, I tend to think of it too as like an additional element that maybe is slightly different from just a criticism is like this. There's an implied gotcha, like it's supposed to be kind of a gotcha moment, like, you know, I've exposed you or something, something to that effect. And, um, what do you think is, what do you think is problematic about that or, or, or dangerous? Well, I, I use the phrase call out culture to refer to a particular style of practicing the art of calling out, because I think calling people out is something that's needed. And there are various contexts throughout history where people have dared to speak truth to power and they've dared to call people out, call people out on their lies or on their BS. And sometimes we have to do that, right? Sometimes we have to step up, be bold and say, hey, that's not right. But when I talk about call out culture, I think they're, 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 it's easy to become addicted to the highs of signaling to other people that you're the kind of person who believes this, and then to use that as a substitute for doing the real hard work that it takes to uh, to create change in the world. So, for instance, it's it's much easier for me to call somebody out on not caring about poor people than it is for me to actually volunteer my time to the homeless, right? And that doesn't mean that if I call people out on not caring about poor people that I'm wrong because there may be a time and place for that. But I just want to point out, it's much easier for me to do that than it is for me to go volunteer my time to the homeless because that's going to cost me energy. It's going to cost me resources. I got to listen to these people talk. I got to help them out. I got to be around them. I, I may have to go into a neighborhood that I'm not comfortable in. And I think when we start to use, we need both, but I think when we start to use one as a substitute for the other, we, put, we produce a culture of people who lose their ability to be right without feeling so righteous about it. And, and, and we lose our ability to, um, to point out flaws in a way that's actually productive. There's a lot of uh, assumptions, I think, wrapped in there too about motives. Uh, it, it often takes the form, at least in the example that you gave, which I think is not uncommon, of what you're calling someone out for is not even the outcome of their actions so much as the motives. Like, oh, you don't care about the poor. Oh, you're just a greedy person. Oh, look at you you do this, but then you're rich and live in a mansion, you know, therefore like there's something nefarious going on. Um, you know, and even, and even the example you gave, like, okay, rather than calling somebody out for not caring about the poor, go volunteer at a homeless shelter. Even that maybe is too easy. Have you really thought about what's the most effective way that you, given your skills can help the poor? Maybe it's volunteering at a homeless shelter. Maybe it's not. Um, it's probably certainly not trying to call someone else out for, for being greedy, but there's, there's sort of a lack of rigor in examining the difference between intentions and outcomes and the difference between pointing out a perceived flaw that somebody else has um, and actually examining your own capabilities, interests, beliefs, and thinking about productive ways to channel those towards the ends that, that you value. Yes, and, and I think we have to ask ourselves, when we speak truth, what's the real motive here? Like you said, am I, am I speaking truth for the satisfaction that comes from the way in which the words come out of my mouth? Am I speaking truth for the satisfaction that comes from feeling superior to another person? Or does the person I'm speaking truth to have anything to do with my motive for communication? If so, I should take that person into account. There's an Indian proverb I love and I often quote, 
And it says, once you've cut off a person's nose, there's no use in giving them a rose to smell. And I, I think it's all too, I think it's too easy to fall back on our right to say what we want to say when we want to say it. And, and I'm, I'm fine with that. Yeah, like everybody's got the right to say what they want to say. And I'm not here to infringe on anyone's right to speak freely. But if I am speaking because I want to have an impact or I want to exercise influence on another person's thinking or behavior, then I should probably take into account what manner of communicating is most likely to get the desired response. And I think we, we, we put such emphasis on our right to say what we want to say that we often miss out on the importance of having an opportunity to be an influencer. Hmm. All right, TK, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Are you ready for this? I'm ready, man. I'm ready. <laughs> I want you to give us a synopsis of everything we've talked about and discussed uh, as ESPN's Stephen A. Smith. <laughs> When I did, when I launched this podcast, I said the point of it is really for my own enjoyment and entertainment. So um, this this seems really uh, important to me. <laughs> well, Stephen A. Smith, I have to work on the voice a little bit, but his whole thing is he spends like five minutes complimenting whatever person he's getting ready to talk about, and he just praises this person over and over again, and and you know it's coming. You you know that. He's praising this person because he's just about to blast them. He's about to knock them down with something hard. So I, I, I kind of got his shtick down a little bit. All right, but come, I'm on, still come on, come on, come on. Give it, yeah, give it to us, man. <laughs> All right, look, uh, this is improv, so I'm going to try, man. All right, um, you, you got to give me a question. <laughs> All right, TK, what is the most important thing to know about people who criticize instead of creating? <laughs> you gotta give me a specific person, man. All right, let, let, let me let me just uh because I need somebody to attack, so I'll just I'll just use you. It's your turn. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> um. <laughs> all right, um, Isaac Morehouse's uh new podcast because this is the first episode, right? Uh, second, but the first, yeah, full episode. Okay, okay, but this is the second episode. So ask me what you think of your podcast. Here we go, Stephen A. Smith. All right, what do you th what do you think of my podcast? <laughs> First of all, let me say that Isaac Morehouse, he's my brother. I love him more than my own brothers. In fact, I love him more than myself. He's been a great fan friend for 15 years, and I have nothing negative to say about the brother. His podcast, absolutely excellent. Praxis, absolutely excellent. Changing the world, revolutionizing education. Isaac Morehouse is the man. If you don't know who he is, you got to check out the blog because if you ain't doing that, you're missing out. With that having been said, never, ever insult me by creating a podcast and put me on a second episode. <laughs> you were the best man at my wedding. Why am I not on the first episode of the Isaac Morehouse podcast? Come on, man. <laughs> Oh, classic, classic stuff. Set me up with the praise and bring it down here. That was brilliant. My guest today has been TK Coleman, the education director for Praxis. Uh, one of my good friends, I think one of the most interesting, well-read uh, people, most curious people that you could ever meet. You can check out his stuff at tkcoleman.com. He also blogs weekly at blog.discoverpraxis.com. And he is active on Twitter and Facebook though he may not enter a comment war with you if you want to critique his stuff. TK, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure, man. Peace.